coming in throughout the session. So hello, good morning. Just as a starting note, we are going to be recording this education event. So just so everyone's aware, um, and then hopefully it will be available to see later on our YouTube channel. Um, but we can certainly confirm that towards the end of the course of the day. Um, so my name's Saba uh, Mahmood. I'm one of the clinical nurse specialists here at King's College Hospital in um, paediatric haemoglobinopathies, but I have a double role. So um, I also work part time as the education lead for nursing within our haemoglobinopathy uh, coordinating centre. So um, I'm here kind of in both capacities throughout the day. Um, you'll probably get sick of me, but it is what it is. Um, so just a few things to um, get started. If we could ask for everyone to just keep their mics muted when the presentations are being given. So the talks are all planned for about half hour and then we've got a 10 minute uh, Q&A session after each talk. So in that time, I'll be welcoming any hands up to ask questions uh, directly if you want for the speaker or if you could pop your questions into the chat box throughout the talks, then I'll be kind of manning that throughout the day and just presenting questions to speakers um, if you don't want to talk, which is absolutely fine. Um, also, we are going to be um, providing certificates for attendance for this event. There are no uh, CPD hours attached to it, but I can provide certificates, especially for um, nurses who would want to use it for revalidation or whatever. Um, but we would ask if you could kindly complete the evaluation form um, and then based on that and the email addresses we accumulate, I can then send out um, certificates to everyone who's attended um, throughout the day today. Um, I know a lot of people will be coming in and out of talks that they want to listen to, which is absolutely fine. Um, happy to still provide certificates for the day. Um, so we've had a couple of changes to the agenda I just want to bring to your attention. Um, due to unforeseen circumstances, we've had one of the uh, blood transfusion practitioners, Kelly, uh, drop out this afternoon. So um, in my true paediatric nurse specialist hat on, <laughs> I'm going to try and cover parts of the blood transfusion talk this afternoon at one o'clock instead. Um, my talk will by no means be as technical as Kelly's would be, but I'm going to try and cover the aspects of blood transfusions and red cell exchanges from a ward perspective. So I hope it's still useful um, to the learning for everyone. So um, apolo apologies for that. Um, I think that was, is that all the ground rules that we do these days? I think so. Um, so yeah, it'd be great actually. Um, got a couple of minutes just before Dr. Babika's due to speak. I know she might already be on the call, but it'd be great to know where everyone sort of come from today. Just to have an idea of background for the audience we've got. I know it was it was advertised quite widely. So it'd be good to know um, hospitals people are at and specialities that they work in or what kind of contact they have with sickle cell and thalassemia patients. Just to get a gauge for, you know, the questions and things to expect through the day. Um, and I can try and address specific concerns if if needed as well. So if we spend a couple of minutes just sharing that. Um, and I've got lots of familiar names coming on here as well, which is great to see. Um, but I'll try not to pick on anyone. <laughs> Hello, I'll, I'll start. Um, I'm Rebecca. I work on um, Tony and Guy Ward, which is a general paediatric ward at King's College Hospital. Um, we have quite a lot of sickle cell patients come in and I don't have much experience with uh, thalassemia. So brave. Thank you so much, Rebecca. You're right. <laughs> nice yeah. to see you here. <laughs> <laughs> I, was just, I was just finishing off my tea and toast. Um, that's why I didn't have my camera off. <laughs> happy days, happy days, I'll let you off. <laughs> no, that's great. Hi, I'm Hetty. Um, I'm the paediatric sickle cell thalassemia nurse specialist at Lewisham Greenwich Hospital. Hi, Hetty, you all right? Yeah. Yeah, good. Nice to see you here. Nice to see you. Brilliant. I think it's just, I'm going to just keep reminding everyone throughout the day that this is certainly being recorded to go up onto the um, YouTube channel for STSTN. So um, people on the wards, if you're one person representing your ward, please do cascade the information and the links as they come out so that everyone, when they get a minute um, or four hours, can sit down and just have a, 
a watch of the day and take some learning from it. Absolutely. Look on the chat. Occupational therapist in acute peds. Oh, exciting. It's always nice when the therapies join. I always worry that they get forgotten a little bit when it comes to managing these patients, but actually they're such a crucial part of an admission or outpatient work for um, this patient group. So I'm pleased to see it when OTs and physios are representing. Hello, I'm Dr. Danielle Scott. I'm an educational psychologist. So um, quite interested to know more around the psychological impacts of um, sick cell diagnosis. So I just work with children, young people, once they're in schools, um, but it's still quite useful to have that kind of background information on the medical side as well. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Perfect. Thank you. Welcome. I know we're handing on doors of school educational psychologists as well when it comes to the patients. That's really helpful. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Hi, Anne. Um, hi, my name's Amanda. I'm a paediatric sister at Bedford Hospital, so I work on general peds. But I've just taken over, well, just working alongside one of the managers to help with all the regular blood transfusions that we do. So I'm um, kind of the haematology link as well. So it's a very new area for me. So this information would be very useful. Oh, perfect. Any questions throughout the day, though, please do, you know, ask. Please don't be shy. We'll do. Um, yeah, perfect. Thanks. Thanks for joining. Good morning. My name is Caroline George Davies. I'm community children's nurse um, for sickle cell in Greenwich and Bexley. Hello. Um, I... I've got a few colleagues that are interested, so it would be great to get a copy of the um, recorded um, session. Perfect. Welcome. How are you doing? Yeah, not too bad. Thank you. Yeah, good. Um, hi, I'm um, I'm Natasha Chandler. On um, I work at Darren Valley hospital um i've worked on the um on the ward of the assessment unit for the last um six years and i've recently joined the pediatric um sickle cell team um mm -hmm. so what i would like to get out of today is um i feel like i've got sort of quite a bit of knowledge around um sickle cell but obviously more more knowledge is better mm -hmm. um but i would like to sort of get more knowledge um a sort of around thalassemia because of um we do have like children with thalassemia mm -hmm. um but i feel like i've got more knowledge on sickle cell than i have on thalassemia so i would like to just like to enhance my knowledge on that and and just enhance my knowledge on sickle cell just to support my new role yeah no that's great thank you thank you hopefully we'll achieve that for you today <laughs> thank you Right, I think I will um, make a start with uh, Dr. Sama Babaka. So um, if that's all right, she's one of our um, paediatric haematology consultants at the Evelina Children's Hospital. Um, so great wealth of knowledge about to come your way. So Sama, I will thank you very much for presenting this morning and I will hand straight over to you. And I can see your screen as well. So um, I think the sharing here is fine. Perfect. Um, good morning, everybody. I'm Sama Babuke. Thank you, Saba, for the introduction. Uh, so I'm a consultant hematology, haematologist um, at Evelyn Edge London Children's Hospital. We uh, are going to talk about the acute management in patients with sickle cell disease today. Uh, so uh, does everybody see my screen? Saba, you said you do see it, yeah? Yes, we can see that fine, Samuel. Okay, good. So today we are just going to start off by a, um, one second, just introduction about pediatric sickle cell disease. And I think there's another talk today about uh, thalassemia separately. So in terms of pediatric sickle cell disease, we look after patients uh, from birth until the age of 18 years old. We function as a multidisciplinary team. We have a team consisting of consultants, junior doctors, specialist nurses, uh, community team, psychologists, neuropsychologists, and many, many more. It does really take a village to look after uh, children with sickle cell disease. Um, just as a background, it, sickle cell disease uh, comprises 5% of the world's population, and it's more, most prevalent in parts of Central and West Africa. However, in the UK and England itself, 
sickle cell disease affects one in every 2,000 live births, so it's quite common still. Uh, it is one of the most common genetic conditions affecting people in England, and at the moment we have 15,000 patients with sickle cell disease in the UK, both children and adults. As you all are already aware, it's inherited as an autosomal recessive condition, which means you need one defect affected gene from each parent to have the condition yourself. So both parents being carriers for the sickle cell gene have a 25% chance in having an affected child with hemoglobin SS disease. And there are so many different genotypes. So you can have a sickle cell trait, which is hemoglobin AS, homozygous hemoglobin SS, which is the most common and most severe type of the, of the condition, and these patients have the shortest survival usually. And these are the patients you would normally see on the ward if you are an inpatient setting or even in accident and emergency. Another form of sickle cell disease which is quite severe is hemoglobin S beta naught thalassemia, which is a combination of sickle cell disease and beta thalassemia that can have a quite a severe phenotype as well. Other combinations do exist and severity is variable depending on the amount of affected hemoglobin. Just a, a revision of the genetics of sickle cell disease. So it is a single point mutation condition. It happens in chromosome 11, where one of the uh, amino acids at position 6 changes from glutamine to valine, resulting in a switch from a hemoglobin A, which is a normal hemoglobin, to hemoglobin S, which is a affected hemoglobin. The difference between these hemo two hemoglobins is that the hemoglobin A is hydrophilic, which means it's like water and it doesn't polymerize, but hemoglobin S is hydrophobic and can polymerize in certain conditions such as low oxygen uh, levels. So this is what I mean by polymerization. So in the microcirculation, when the red cell releases all of its oxygen, the hemoglobin S becomes deoxygenated, and that creates exposure of the hydrophobic sites within the hemoglobin structure. And when these hydrophobic sites attach to each other, they create a hemoglobin sickle polymer. So polymers cause a distortion of the infrastructure on the uh, cytoskeleton of the red cell, resulting in a change of the shape from the red cell being nice and round to being a sickle shape. When this happens repeatedly, the sickle shape red cells become irreversibly sickled, and that results in a blockage in the microcirculation. So the sickle cells cannot pass through the small vessels, and that results in a reduction of the blood flow and also results in tissue hypoxia, which forms the basis of the pathophysiology of sickle cell disease. This is what we call vasoclusion, and that's why we call it a vasoclusive crisis when the patients present with pain. However, it's not that simple. Vasoclusion is quite complex in itself. So the first thing is hemoglobin S polymerization, but there are so many other factors that result in vasoclusion. One of them is an increase in the viscosity of the blood, making the resulting in from the red cells being less deformable. And also the sickle cells tend to adhere to other blood cells like white cells and platelets. And there's also a lot of other pathophysiological features such as a diminished nitric oxide level, which is a natural vasodilator. So sickle cell patients have reduced uh, nitric oxide, resulting in narrowing of the blood vessels, further reducing blood flow. So once there is vasoclusion, there's another part of the sickle cell crisis, which is red cell breakdown, or what we call hemolysis. So the combination of having vasoclusion with hemolysis that results in a very severe anemia those three sickle cell pathologies are the underlying uh, causes of the, all of the manifestations that we're going to talk about in a second. So it's a triad of pathophysiology features that result in the clinical manifestations. So common presentations, acute presentations that we would see on the ward or in the A&E setting. So the first most common one is the vesiclusive crisis, painful crisis, fever infection, acute chest syndrome, stroke, which we have another talk about later today, severe anemia, and priapism. So first we'll talk about the painful sickle cell crisis, which is the most common cardinal feature in sickle cell disease. In children, manifestation of an acute painful crisis can happen as early as six months of age. Before six months of age, children are protected from uh, vesoclusive crisis because of the high hemoglobin F levels, which is fetal hemoglobin. Once the fecal hemoglobin levels start to decline beyond six months of age, patients are then at risk of having a sickle cell crisis. That's when the hemoglobin S or sickle hemoglobin levels start to rise. A painful crisis can involve any side of the body, essentially. However, it mo mostly happens in the bones, 
uh, long bones of the chest, of the back, the arms, or the legs. Painful episodes tend to start abruptly and can have can be the only feature of the presentation or may be associated with an underlying illness, mostly infection. I uh, just want to mention that pain is quite subjective and there's no test to confirm the presence or the absence of pain. So we always tend to believe our patients, even children. So young, the younger sickle cell patients from the age of six to eight months can present with a, a hallmark manifestation of sickle cell disease, which is called dactylysis. So if you see the hands of these uh, infants are swollen, the fingers look like sausage shapes. This is called hand and foot syndrome. We used to call it hand and foot syndrome. It's essentially a dactylitis secondary to vasoclusion in the, digit, in the digital bones. So it's a combination of microvascular occlusion, inflammation, and reperfusion injury once um, the um, blood flow is reestablished to the digits. This results in something called a reperfusion injury, which causes more tissue damage and more pain, more swelling, turns out into a vicious cycle. So this is a very common presentation. So that's what we would see in an infant of that age. When a patient presents with a painful uh, vasoclusive crisis, the first thing is to do a pain assessment. So we have different scales that can be used for pain ranking in pediatrics. We use the Wong Baker or the FLAC. So I'll show you how these look like. This is a, a very common and very easy for children uh, to understand. We have that we have those on the walls in our cubicles in A and E, uh, where the children that are able to speak, maybe over six, seven years old, would look at the pictures on the wall and you'd ask them, "How would you rate your pain?" So a smiley face uh, with a score of zero, that means no pain at all, up to a maximum of a score of ten with a very sad crying face. Most children are very good in describing where their pain lies at, um, and you know, you'd be able to uh, manage them accordingly. If a child is younger than that or cannot express their pain be due to being in so much pain they cannot speak to you, then we can use something called the flak pain scale. So this one allows you to assess the patient's face, legs, activity, crying, and how consolable they are by giving them a score of zero, one, or two, and this gives you a maximum of 10. So according to this, you are able to score the patient's pain depending on examination, um, and then that will allow you to further treat them. So once the pain is assessed, our current uh, NICE recommendation is that pain assessment and initial management, initial analgesia, must happen within the first 30 minutes of presentation. This is a, a national guidance, and we are always aiming, uh, trying our best to achieve those guidelines, and we're quite good in our centers, but uh, we can definitely always do better in terms of getting to these patients within 30 minutes and giving them analgesia. Uh, analgesia choice. So we could always start with simple non-opioid analgesia, but also if that doesn't work, we are able to escalate to opioid analgesia. So we'll talk about analgesia in a second, but another important part of managing a crisis is hydration, whether it's oral hydration, if a person is able to take orally, if not, then we are always aiming to give them intravenous fluids to help improve the hydration of their red cells because a dehydrated red cell is more likely to sickle and cause further crisis. It's also, children with sickle cell disease often have impaired fluid balance due to renal sickle nephropathy, etc. So we always monitor the fluid balance very carefully and ensure they're well hydrated. Oxygen supplementation is very important, particularly if they have low oxygen saturations. However, some children find oxygen to have a relieving uh, effect on their pain. That is because the oxygenated hemoglobin S, as we just discussed, results in more sickling, more crisis. So it may be used for comfort in some situations. Uh, again, non-medical techniques for children, such as using a heat pack, massaging them, or using distraction techniques can be helpful. Analgesia. Analgesia choice. The, your local practice may vary. However, Always we start with a simple analgesic, such as paracetamol, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories or opioids. Uh, not non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, but sometimes we escalate to opioids. So you score the patient's pain, either mild, moderate, or severe. For mild, a score of one to three, simple analgesia might suffice. You might want to introduce dihydrocodone if you're not getting on top of the pain. For moderate pain, a score of four to six, simple analgesia, dihydrocodone introduction of oral morphine. For severe pain, Anything above seven, you might introduce intranasal diamorphine, and if not controlled, you might want to escalate to intravenous 
uh, patient controlled or nurse controlled analgesia. So once the, this is in the first 30 minutes, the patient gets some form of analgesia, simple and opioid. After 30 minutes, the patient is assessed again. And if the patient reports satisfactory relief, then beyond that 30 minutes, there can be an assessment every four hours. However, if the patient does not report any satisfactory relief, there should be an ongoing assessment of pain every 30 minutes until we achieve that. So after the first 30 minutes, if the patient remains having severe pain more than seven, seven to 10, then we could consider intravenous analgesia such as morphine, patient-controlled analgesia or nurse-controlled analgesia. We do have alternatives to morphine. If a patient is allergic or can't have it for any reason, we could use oxycodone or fentanyl in the same way. We also consider um, adjuvants such as clonidine and ketamine to optimize uh, pain control. If you have a pain team available where you work, it would be very good to involve them in the care and uh, get some advice as well. Patients are usually admitted for pain management, uh, and then we ensure that their pain and their observations are assessed regularly. Although we do have protocols and guidelines where, you know, in, in any hospital, however, it always has to be a case-by-case -case assessment. So always ask yourself, does this patient have an individualized care plan? Because often children with complex pain histories do have an individualized care plan, uh, depending on what they've had in the past. Also ask, what have they already had? Did they already have opioids in the ambulance or somewhere else? What have they used in previous painful crisis that worked or did not work? And also check if there's any contraindications we wouldn't be giving non-steroidal anti-inflammatories in patients with renal failure. Monitor closely. Oxygen saturation is very important. We like to keep them more than 94% at all times and also encourage the use of incentive spirometry and we'll talk about why in a second. Uh, we always make sure that we give adjuvants such as antiemetics, antihistamines and laxatives to mitigate the side effects of uh, opioid analgesia. We encourage hydration and mobilization and also explore the triggers. So girls for teenager girls that are menstruating, they usually would not volunteer that they've had their period, but it's important to ask because often menstruation can be associated with a vesiclusive crisis and also psychological support. Uh, offer it if it is available and also ask, was this crisis precipitated by any emotional distress? Did the patient undergo any bullying? Have they been feeling different from their peers, missing school or having academic decline? Often emotional distress is a very uh, common cause of triggering a vesiclusive crisis in children. We will quickly talk about infection and fever in sickle cell disease. So fever presentations comprise 50% of admissions in those under five years old. Very common and we know that children with sickle cell disease are at very high risk of developing uh, infections because they have a functional asplenia or hypersplenism and that's secondary to the recurrent um, microinfarcts that have occurs in their spleens. So hypospinism occurs in 90% of children with sickle cell disease, and they, that puts them at risk of infections, which could be life-threatening with organisms such as streptococcus pneumonia and haemophilus influenzae. Their risk of these infections is 600 times greater than a young person of their age in the general population. And also recurring tissue ischemia or necrosis in their bones, for example, creates an idis for infections such as salmonella, resulting in osteomyelitis. So infection is a big one in sickle cell disease. Before we talk about treatment of infection, we talk about prevention of infection. So all children with sickle cell disease should be taking prophylactic antibiotics, penicillin, starting as early as one to two months of age. We also always uh, stress about immunization in the clinic appointments. So we make sure that they have been fully immunized with their childhood vaccines. Um, and then once they are more than two years old, we ensure that they have all of the uh, Pneumovax 23 valent vaccination every five years. We also ensure that they get the an annual flu vaccine. And for those that uh, are over five years, we encourage COVID vaccination. Another preventative um, measure would be ensuring that these patients have malaria prophylaxis when they're abroad in endemic areas. Of, most of them would be of African origin and would go back to Africa at some point. So malaria prophylaxis is very important for these children. So assessing a child with a fever, we always encourage, patient, uh, encourage parents to bring their children to hospital if they have a temperature of more than 38.5 degrees. We have a very low threshold for admission, especially for those under one year of age, because these patients can deteriorate very quickly. We always ask about travel history. We do this basic blood, such as full blood count, reticulocyte count, biochemistry, and ensure we have a group and save. 
We do a full septic screen, including virology and urine cultures and a respiratory viral swab, looking for a reason for fever. Chest x-ray is done for those with low oxygen saturations or any respiratory symptoms. And then the rest of these investigations are guided by the symptoms of the patient. So abdominal pain would trigger an abdominal ultrasound, soft tissue swelling or pain would trigger soft tissue ultrasound, etc. cetera. Uh, broad spectrum antibiotics are very important and we also tend to cover for, for atypical organisms and we would always follow our local antibiotic guidelines for that. Um, I think it's very important to ensure that we, uh, we are aware and we also make sure others are aware that doubling up on penicillin prophylaxis to treat sickle cell patients with fever is not good practice. Um, this does happen, unfortunately, in primary care, but also sometimes in secondary care. So it's important to spread the knowledge about um, that a double dose of penicillin prophylaxis is not sufficient to treat a patient with sickle cell disease that is coming in with a fever. Uh, if you have an ID team, an orthopedic team, of course, always liaise with them and uh, ensure follow-up is in place because often infections that are quite severe, such as osteomyelitis, might require longer courses of antibiotics, sometimes six weeks at a time. Okay, so we'll talk about acute chest syndrome. So acute chest syndrome is one of the most severe manifestations of sickle cell disease, and it's the second commonest cause of hospitalization. It's defined as a new pulmonary infiltrate involving at least one complete lung segment, that is consolidation on a chest x-ray, but excluding atelectasis. So with the chest x-ray changes, there should be at least one of the following. Chest pain is the biggest one. However, be mindful that children may not always point to their chest, often they can report, be reported as abdominal pain instead. Uh, then you could have a fever, a temperature of more than 38.5, tachypnea, tachycardia, wheeze or crackles on examination, and a cough that may or may not be productive. So the causes of acute chest syndrome, 40 to 50 percent of patients are initially admitted with something else. Either they're in hospital because they have a vasoclusive crisis or they have another problem that's put them in hospital and tends to develop an acute chest syndrome. And usually it is around patients that are unable to take a deep breath because they're having back pain, rib pain or abdominal pain, or they're quite heavily sedated from analgesia. The inability to take a deep breath or sit up can cause a vicious cycle of hypoxia, sickling, more hypoxia, resulting in acute chest syndrome. Another common cause is infection. Fatty embolism can be a cause not very common in children. And then again, of course, just vasoclusion because of sickle cell, uh, sickle red cells in the pulmonary circulation. And often in 45% of cases, we don't know what the cause is. Infectious causes, mycoplasma and respiratory syncytial virus are the commonest causes in pediatrics. However, any, any form of pulmonary infection such as influenza or tuberculosis can result in an acute chest syndrome. This is what we were talking about in terms of vasoclusion in the pulmonary vasculature, resulting in a hypoxia, reduced oxygenation, and then more sickling. This all results from the hemoglobin S polymerization that we talked about in the beginning. Sickled red cells block the, block the blood flow, and that just results in a continuous cycle of more sickling until we're able to break that cycle by treatment. Other causes of or mechanisms where, where um, acute chest syndrome would develop is a worsening anemia, where the cause, that causes reduced oxygen carrying capacity of the blood and increased tissue damage. Hemolysis, like we said in the beginning, can trigger more, um, more vasoclusion, inflammation, reperfusion, and acute heart failure can all contribute to acute chest syndrome. Assessment of these patients. It's very important to take a good history and examination because the main thing we're trying to do is identify patients likely to require more support, as in, in a high dependency unit setting or a PQ setting. These patients can deteriorate extremely quickly, and therefore we have to be very vigilant in identifying them, diagnosing them, and getting early intervention. Um, we initially, the initial investigations would just be blood count, blood counts, full blood counts, reticulocyte count, biochemistry, infection markers, and a group and save sample. If the patient is febrile, we culture their blood, we culture their sputum if it's productive, and uh, we also do respiratory viral swab. What we're looking for is the uh, oxygen saturation remaining more than 94% at all times. Outcomes of acute chest syndrome, it's usually much better in younger children and worse in teenagers and adults, but it does have a qu quite a significant uh, mortality rate of 3%, so this is definitely a medical emergency that requires prompt treatment. 
Another thing that can happen is patients with acute chest syndrome. Acute chest syndrome itself is an independent risk factor for developing a stroke in sickle cell disease children, and we have a talk about that later. Treatment. The initial treatment is supportive, so ensuring that there's adequate analgesia, adequate hydration, and that patients have an incentive spirometer to use at the bedside, and that's very important to improve oxygenation and reduce the amount of sickling occurring in the lungs. Maintaining oxygen levels at more than 94%, using antibiotics as we already spoke about, bronchodilators such as salbutamol, nebulizers could be helpful if there's evidence of any airway hyperactivity, and close clinical monitoring. If there's any other evidence of deterioration in uh, that there should be a immediate communication with HDU or PQ because these patients might need invasive or non-invasive ventilation to maintain adequate oxygenation of their lungs, escalating of their antibiotics, assessing of the fluid fluid levels regularly because they are at risk of fluid overload in acute chest syndrome, blood transfusion, we'll talk about that in a second, and then corticosteroids. We don't often need to use corticosteroids in acute chest syndrome. We can manage them with initial therapy, antibiotics, and blood transfusion. However, if the patient is continues to deteriorate, we are able to use dexamethasone to treat them. So blood transfusion, what we're trying to achieve is to reduce the hemoglobin S percentage. And also we can achieve that either by doing a simple top of transfusion up to hemoglobin of 100. Alternatively, we can do an exchange blood transfusion and that is very dependent on the availability. But there have been studies that suggest that there's no advantage to exchanges over simple transfusion for this particular indication, other, unlike other indications. But for acute chest syndrome, a simple top of transfusion would suffice in most situations. And sometimes what we do is we start with the top of transfusion if we're able to achieve um, breaking the cycle of continuous sickling and hypoxia, that's great. If we're not able, then that's where we would go for an exchange blood transfusion. Okay, we'll quickly talk about severe anemia. Severe anemia is defined as a fall in hemoglobin of more than 20 gram per liter from baseline. Usually patients would present being very lethargic and having pallor. Patients usually need an urgent hematology assessment and the two main causes in pediatrics are a plastic crisis and a sequestration crisis. A sequestration crisis can be either splenic sequestration or hepatic sequestration. Splenic sequestration is very common and it occurs in children with hemoglobin assessed disease that are younger than two years of age However, those with SC or SB-Tethyl have a lifetime risk of this. All that happens is that in sickle cell disease, if you've got multiple microinfarcts in the spleen, that can result over time when the, in the trapping of the blood within the spleen, and that causes an enlargement of the spleen, and on examination, you have a, a tender splenomegaly. It causes an acute drop in the blood count. This patient would, would present with very severe anemia. Hemoglobin could be as low as 30 or 40 gram per liter. But this is a medical emergency because they also present with hypovolemic shock. So, and that can result, unfortunately, in sudden death. So this is an emergency that needs to be promptly recognized and promptly treated. The main stay of treatment is rapid transfusion, particularly if they're hypovolemic. We were also careful about how much we transfuse these patients. So because the blood is pooled in the spleen, once we transfuse them and they're more hemodynamically stable, this all of this pooled blood will go back into the circulation. So what we advise is a rapid transfusion, but a gentle in terms of target. So we would not transfuse this patient with splenic sequestration up to a hemoglobin of 100 like we would do in acute chest syndrome. We'd aim for a lower hemoglobin such as 70 or 80, or 80 dependent on the clinical picture. Unfortunately, splenic sequestration has a long-term frequent recurrence rate. Most children end up requiring some form of long-term treatment, either it's red, red cell transfusion therapy, but most of the cases we need to do a splenectomy to, uh, to stop the recurrence of sequestration crisis. Another cause of uh, severe anemia is the aplastic crisis. So this is a temporary cessation of the red cell production associated with a shortened red cell survival. It occurs due to an infection with a virus called parvovirus B19. This is the most common cause of aplastic crisis. Patients present with a very severe anemia. Again, HB can be as low as 50 uh, or 40 gram per liter. But in this situation, the reticular side count would also be very low. So that's a telltale sign of a parvovirus B19 aplastic crisis. Patients often complain that they've been having a fever or feeling unwell or very tired for a few days before presenting to hospital. Aplastic crisis is again treated with a blood transfusion, but also 
uh, gentle and careful about transfusion for these patients because eventually they will recover and they will be able to make their own red cells. Um, and then the good thing about aplastic crust is that it is very, very rarely going to recur. It's usually a one-off thing unless patients are unlucky and they, uh, they contract parvovirus B19 twice. Okay, so we'll quickly talk about priapism. So priapism is a surgical emergency. So all of we, we talked about, some of the, what we talked about is a medical emergency. This one is a surgical emergency. So that is essentially a persistent and a painful erection that occurs in sickle cell boys. So it's most, most common in patients with sickle cell disease, homozygous hemoglobin SS disease or uh, S beta naught. So those with a more severe phenotype tend to suffer from priapism more. It's very common in sickle cell boys. So 35 to 90% of male patients with sickle cell disease can suffer sickle priapism at some point in their life. We have two different types or presentations of priapism, either it's a stuttering priapism or a fulminant priapism. We call it fulminant priapism when it lasts for more than two hours and that's when it becomes a surgical emergency. Patients that have untreated priapism have a risk of erectile dysfunction and impotence. So it's important to recognize priapism and it's often something that will not be volunteered by children, particularly on the ward. Uh, so it's important to ask a child or ask a parent if they have noticed that the patient has uh, priapism. And it's also common in a patient that's already hospitalized. So similar to uh, acute chest syndrome, when you're already in hospital with a crisis, you're at risk of developing acute chest syndrome. Again, if you're already in a crisis yeah. and you're a boy with sickle cell disease, you're at risk of having priapism. So the initial treatment is analgesia, adequate hydration, exercise if patient is able, and then palpating for a bladder because often they cannot pass urine due to the priapism and the pain. And we encourage them to pass urine. And if they are unable to pass urine, we could introduce an, a catheter to help them. The initial treatment for priapism is definitely surgical. So we always contact the urology te team to review. Uh, they can do a few interventions, either it's penile aspiration or irrigation, but also they are able to do intracavernosal injections of things like epinephrine, sympathomimetics like epinephrine to help relieve the priapism. If all the surgical interventions have been unsuccessful, that is when sickle cell treatment could play a role. And again, the main sickle cell treatment would be transfusion, whether it's top of transfusion or an exchange of transfusion, depending on the clinical picture and their blood counts. Uh, so initially, and most importantly, is a surgical intervention. There is a drug called etilephrine. It can be used acutely, it's not licensed in children, unfortunately, but we can still use it if nothing else is working. And it can also be used for long-term management of um, priapism in these boys. All right, so that's it. I think we have two minutes to spare. Any questions? Let me look at the chat. Thank you, Sama. No, that's brilliant. Um, I've got one here. It was just to say that um, they missed what the contraindications for NSAIDs was. It was a bit um, earlier on in the talk. So patients with uh, renal impairment or um, affected kidney function, you would probably want to avoid it in the acute setting and you'd use alternative analgesia. And do you think we'd apply the same to those that have um, an asthma diagnosis? I know there's some patients that do and don't use ibuprofen and things when it comes to their asthma. What's your take on it? So anything, anything that the patient has reacted to before, and that's why individualized treatment um, is important. Anything the patient cannot take or has reacted to negatively in the past, we will try to avoid that. Um, Fine. That's so. Brilliant. Um, welcome to take any hands if people have got questions um, or any more in the chat. Um, And Sama, just in terms of your experience of covering uh, children on the wards um, and sort of nursing aspects of providing care, there was a lot that was covered and it was all really important. I mean, for me, in centre spirometry for acute chest is the one that really hit home in terms of if you get that in early, you, sometimes we even pop that straight in at the A&E stage if we think that's where the patient's going down in terms of diagnosis, then it really does um help with turnaround as well as the transfusion do you find that um 
the, the proactiveness of using an incentive parameter is there for um, your patients or is it lots of prompting and things that we still need to do? I agree, it, has to, it should be something that's introduced very early on in an admission in, a, in any patient with sickle cell disease being admitted because the risk of developing acute chest syndrome is quite high and it should be offered to anybody with or without any chest symptoms at all. Uh, and introducing it in A&E would be great, uh, but even if not possible, then at, on arrival on the ward, any child with sickle cell disease should be offered an incentives parameter. We do, we do have a very good um, ward here at Evelina. I don't know where pe uh, people are lo logged in from all over the country, but I think it's very important if it's not available widely in your center to prompt that or try and change the culture in terms of making it a more common thing on the ward to offer to sickle cell disease patients because it makes a huge difference. That's it. And with COVID as well, we found that across a lot of hospitals, they've had to move patients regular wards where they'd be admitted in terms of losing that slight bit of nursing expertise and losing that bit of you know knowledge where people have looked after these patients again and again. And I found that on discussing it with people and the challenges they faced, it's more like haematology link nurses or the specialist nurses like running around with incentive barometers and bits and bobs to other wards, providing teaching widely. So it's something that's definitely been disrupted, I think, over the last couple of years, but then highlighted to, I think, us as a centre um, that actually maybe we need to rethink about how things are done for our patients because they could end up being admitted on any ward. And then you need to actually be mindful of the fact that it might not be something that these nurses and doctors come across very often. And just having those prompts in your mind that actually um, if, if you're a specialist within the field or not, or if you're a senior nurse um, working on the ward, that actually we need to remember to think about these external things, I say, which are like other interventions and therapies that can help turn these patients around. Yes, but yeah. I think also if an actual incentive parameter is not available, then there's so many other things you can do. Either asking them to, giving them a, like a plastic glove that they could blow into, uh, or giving them a yeah. uh, a bottle with um, a straw that they can blow into to create bubbles, at, bubbles, yeah, dub doubles <laughs> as a game, um, yeah. and also a big syringe like a 50 ml, 60 ml syringe that they can blow into just to help open up their lung spaces. Anything that is available on any ward could be used as an intense incentive parameter if not available. So. Perfect. And it doesn't require specialist physio input either. You know, I find that a lot of people are waiting for physios to come around and things, but these are things that nurses and student nurses can, um, or healthcare assistants, anybody can just go and get a bucket with a bit of water and a bit and the cut a bit of oxygen tubing or whatever you want to do yeah. and just do the bubbles. You don't have to wait for the physio to come, don't have to wait for the specialist to come and we can kind of get these things in just to turn these patients around. No, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I've got another question just here. Is that something physios? Oh, ha, just said. <laughs> physios Perfect can, timing, yes. physios physios can yes. help with this. No, go ahead, Sama. Is this something that physios would be able to help with? Yes, yes, absolutely. As you were just saying, Faba, it's uh, something that physiotherapy would be able to help. But it's, I think it's just dependent on availability and what time of the day, if it's in hours, out of hours. If you are able to get a physiotherapist, that is excellent. If not, then simple measures like encouraging patients to use a spirometer if available, if not, even if you don't have any of the things we just discussed, simply sit, asking a patient to sit up, right, take a deep breath five times every one hour would suffice. So we ask them to sit up straight, take very deep breaths with the mouth open five to 10 times every hour on the dot. That would be in, enough in most cases to prevent complications and prevent developing an acute chest syndrome. Even if you don't have any resources at all, that is something that you could advise the patients to do. Um, hello, um, Dr. Summer. It's really, this is Rebecca here. Um, it was a really great presentation. Thank you. Um, I was just talking about the incentive parameter. Is it something that we can encourage them to do at home once they're discharged as well, or should we leave that just to the hospital? Absolutely. If, if you, we do give a patient a status parameter, we always send them home with it. And we advise right. them it for the next few days of uh, being at home after discharge. And that's again for the same purpose. And I think uh, there's a question also about what's the purpose of the incentive parameter? Does it open up the air and lung spaces? Yes. So taking a very deep breath, trying to blow into the incentive parameter and uh, allows the air spaces to open 
wide and increase oxygenation of the blood and therefore increase oxygenation of the red cells, the sickle cells, and prevent them from changing their shape into sickle shaped and therefore break the cycle of this sickling, less oxygen, less um, oxygen delivered to the tissues and more sickling. So it's essentially to increase the lung space capacity, increase oxygenation of the, of the blood and reduce the sickling in the blood itself. Yes, we do. We do send patients home with the uh, incentive barometer. Um, and then just for when, say, when they've got over this crisis, um, just before they, say, if they were to start having some chest pain in a few months' time, um, can they start taking it then? Or should they be encouraged to kind of go to hospital then? Yes, if a person has a crisis at home that is not managed by simple analgesia, we always advise them to promptly come to hospital for treatment. Using a status barometer pending coming to hospital or even on the way in is definitely going to help. But if a person is in crisis, we always recommend urgent treatment. And that's why even when they're at hospital in A&E, we recommend very prompt treatment within half an hour. So it is a good thing to do, but I wouldn't uh, advise parents to use it at home until and you know to expect improvement so if a person has got to that point where they are in pain they should really be seen in hospital for oh, right. analgesia yeah but it, it would help yeah thank you thanks Rebecca and I've got one hand up from uh, Carolyn George Davies yeah I just have a uh, sort of a contributor com comments really because um in my local area usually the uptake of incentive spirometry isn't so great so i find i work in the community so i find that getting the children or the young people and parents sort of comfortable with it you know um and to realize that it's a simple exercise it's not some you know fa fancy technique that's needed it, it kind of supports them when they go into hospital and then they see it as a normal part of their management but then again it with the advent of COVID, with the start of covid we sort of didn't have a lot of supply but yes using in the community i have found to be quite helpful obviously not as their main treatment they will then go to hospital but then the uptake in hospital is better because they already are comfortable with using it yes absolutely so it was just my comment <laughs> yes thank you there's a question in the chat isn't this ever so someone's Oh, Danielle Scott is asking, what would you advise for school staff to help a child with sickle cell? So um, we are able to uh, send schools a, in a care plan for sickle cell disease patients so that those care plans include things like a brief explanation of what sickle cell disease is, because often the problem is a lack of knowledge or just exposure to sickle cell in the first place. So an explanation of what sickle cell disease is, what a child with sickle cell disease could um, experience, such as having pain or feeling more tired, unable to complete a football match, for example, and being allowed to take some rest if they need it. And also it highlights the importance of simple things like keeping the child warm, um, allowing them to wear layers, even if others are OK with uh, the weather and allowing them to be encouraging them to be very well hydrated, uh, because these things are very important in uh, what the school child experience would be. Other things include if they are in pain, what do the teachers need to do? You know, things like simple analgesia, making sure it's available, being offered to them. Um, and if pain is not controlled, making sure they have contact numbers and ensuring that their parents are contacted or ambulance, et cetera, whatever is required. So school care plans are very important in the management of pediatric sickle cell because children spend a lot of time in school, clearly. So it's important that the school is well educated and well informed and is able to uh, manage patients with sickle cell disease properly. I think, uh, I don't know, Sabah, maybe you'll tell me, but I think, uh, and also anyone that's in the community, uh, school visits are something that we used to do, uh, and hopefully we'll be able to do again, and just to have a face-to-face -face education with the teachers and the school environment to help and support these schools and dealing with the children. Yes, absolutely. And we also, I do appreciate that um, we're very fortunate in London that we do have community nurses who are specialists in sickle cell care and can go out and provide that specialist input. And I know it's, it's a bit of a challenge when you're outside of those areas where you have that cover and speciality available. Um, but then for those people outside of London, it's kind of important for you to tap in through the parents with their clinicians in the hospital. So whoever they might go and see for clinic appointments will be able to help provide support or signpost you to where 
to get access to these care plans for them specifically or providing sort of training on inset days and things like that. I know I've certainly tapped into schools and things outside of London to help support this where they haven't got um, community specialists um, in place. So I know the structure varies depending on where you're from, but it's not to say that it's not there. You just have to sort of move around a little bit to ask where to get this help from. Absolutely. Lovely. Thank you very much, Sama. Um, great talk. Thank great discussion there. Thank you. Um, and I think we are on track to move on to our next speakers. So um, next we've got um, Maria and Stacey, who are clinical paediatric psychologists here at King's College Hospital. Um, and they're going to be covering psychological experiences of patients with sickle cell anemia and thalassemia. So I'm going to hand over to you guys now um, and then we'll join you back when it's time for the Q&A. All right, thank, thank you very you, much. Sarah. Thank you, Saba, and thank you for inviting us today. Um, so I am Stacey. I am one of the clinical psychologists here at King's on the paediatric sickle cell and thalassemia team. And I've got, and I am Maria, the second of the two clinical psychologists. Thank you for having us. Going to share some slides. Uh, we're trying to. Yeah, this one. Yeah. Uh, please let us know that we can see the slides. You can see the presentation. On yeah. Screen. Yeah, yeah. I can, I can see a presentation. Yeah. Sorry. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. So just as a bit of an introduction, we use this slide um, to think about where we all sit. Um, in position to meeting with young people who have sickle cell or thalassemia. And we use the sort of trio here at the, at the very start to think about the overlap. Um, so a young person coming into the hospital meets with many of us, they meet with the medical team uh, where the focus is largely on the body and on physical health. They meet with psychiatrists or neurologists where the focus might be more on the brain um, and neural development. And they meet with us as psychologists um, when there might be difficulties, thinking about diff difficult emotions, difficult thoughts or feelings. And I think it's important to think about this context in the young people that we meet um, because it is in meeting with, with all of us and in meeting with family or school or friends within these relationships that children and young people develop an understanding of their health condition, um, of what it means, of what it is. Um, and you can imagine, I guess, if you think about a context where the focus is maybe largely on limitations um, or keeping one safe, uh, maybe a young person develops lots of thoughts about what they can't do and maybe feeling quite restricted by their health condition. And you can imagine then that this leads to maybe some difficult thoughts or feelings about how it is to be that young person and to live with sickle cell or thalassemia. And you contrast that maybe with a different, um, a different situation where the focus is on helping or supporting a young person to do as much as they can um, within, within their limitations, I guess, or within what feels right for them. And the focus maybe is less on what they can do, but more on what they can do. And that maybe means a young person who experiences uh, a more typical social life, a more typical school experience. And you can see then that maybe there are less difficult thoughts or feelings that arise um, regarding one's health condition. And I say that at the very beginning to, to set the scene, I guess, in thinking about how young people come to understand their health condition um, and what it is to live with a health condition, how they develop an understanding of what it means, um, how they develop ideas about their identity, um, in living with sickle cell. And this happens largely socially in conversation with us as psychologists, in conversation with the medical team, in conversations within families, um, with peers at school. And it's thinking about how we facilitate some of these conversations um, in our interactions with young people and the impact we might have in the understanding that they come to develop. Would you like to add anything? And I, sorry. Oh, yeah. sorry. Can I just ask for you guys to put the presentation on slideshow just so yeah. it's a bit bigger on the screen? Oh, there we go. 
Oh, perfect. Thank you very much. We can see that. Brilliant. Thanks. Sorry. I, I was just thinking that um, the, the, this picture, this graph is taken out of a leaflet that we use in the transition clinic um, with um, the young people who are yeah, above 15 um, coming, transitioning from the PEDS to the other services. And in a way, we're trying to say that uh, we are our body, our brain and our mind. We're all three of these things. We're not just one of them. We're all three together creating who we are as people. And um, that is why all, all, them, all these different professionals work together uh, holistically uh, because we're not just our body. We're not just our sickle cell or pain or whatever the, the presentation. We are everything. We're, we are the thoughts, the feelings and the behaviour. And I think very nicely you brought into the conversation, the conversation, language, understanding and language. And we would like to, because today we're talking about the experience, mm -hmm. um, how, how patients experience, what, what's their psychological experience. Uh, we thought that it would be a good idea to start with what children understand of what illness is. Um, and th th there is, there's been this debate for years. Um, should we tell children uh, uh, that they have an illness, that they are sick or they have a condition or we shouldn't? So there are people who say, no, they don't understand because they're really young. So we, we shouldn't say anything or we're going to make them more anxious, more worried because they don't understand. They may be more anxious. Um, so there is a tendency and a view that maybe um, when the children are really young, we shouldn't be talking to them about, you know, having a medical condition. Uh, but actually, the, the current thinking is that um, children actually, even if we don't explicitly say something to them, they are aware that there is something about them, something different. Um, and only if you think about a five-year-old or a six-year-old or even a four-year-old coming to the hospital every three months, every six months, having blood tests or coming to a &E &E or uh, being admitted. So they experience, they have an experience, but that experience is never discussed with them. Um, so these may may lead to them feeling isolated, lonely. Um, they may have greater distress. They may experience more anxiety and more worries because they leave something, they experience something. They have no explanation about what is that that they experience. And because they're children, their fantasy, their imagination and their fantasy starts working. And usually it's much worse than the reality. So um, that is why they may get more anxious if nothing is discussed with them. Uh, but again, it's important to use language that it's developmentally appropriate um, for each age. I'm just thinking as well to think about the initial image that we used of the overlap between, between us as professionals and at home as well. And I guess something about the importance of having these conversations is that we use a consistent message here at the hospital or coming into appointments and for parents at home. I think sometimes parents have an experience of maybe not being sure what to say or how to say as well. And using appointments or using visits to the hospital maybe models or shares having those conversations with mm. parents and families um, to think about how we use the same message. Yeah. And just some general information. We thought that maybe it would be good to share this with you. Um, general child development um, based on the theory of Piaget that was um, um, a very famous psychologist who came up with the development of um, the child's cognitive um, functions. So under the three years, um, the, um, the child uh, is very, he, the, their understanding is very limited of cause and effect, what causing something. Um, 
basically they focus on the present and there is little awareness or the concept of future is not there and they over generalize experiences so basically it's here and now no future here and now uh, whatever i do causes whatever happens next and i'm all about sensory information i'm all about tasting touching exploring uh, then we move on to between three and seven years where uh, they are again concerned with the immediate environment. They're more egocentric. Everything is explained with them being at the centre. Uh, everything is explained how they see things, how they understand things. Uh, they, are, yeah, they, they are more conscious of others, distress, um, and they are more aware of behaviours that they can promote good health. But still, there is a magical thinking. Uh, if I think something, it will happen. And some blaming self, uh, blaming the self. Oh, this happened because I wasn't good enough. Because I, because I upset my mum. Then mum slipped and uh, she hurt her leg, for example. Then we move on to between seven and eleven years old, still in primary school. Um, where the perspective changes a bit, they're more concerned with what other people think, they're more able to consider what other people may think. They have more complex understanding of the role of the self in relation to the world and others. Uh, they go out of you know, themselves to think about other people as well, um, but still very much concerned with their own perspective uh, but now they can know, they can consider other people as well. Uh, and they may internalize and somatize the distress if conversations are not encouraged. And then we go to, we move on to early teenage years onwards, uh, where they can, it's more like adults. Yeah, towards adult thinking, they have um, now abstract thinking, they can think in abstract concepts, they can understand of the future, they have a better concept of what the future is. Um, still limited, but they know that there is a future um, and uh, influenced by the peer group mainly, and they understand of complex contexts uh, more. And thinking of the general development, then we can think of how and with the brain being less mature, being younger and the brain maturing as they grow older, meaning that more cognitive functions mature as they grow older, uh, we can see uh, how they can, you know, what the concept, how the concept of illness can be structured, um, can exist in their minds. So when they're really, really young, between the ages of four and seven, uh, basically they're dominated by thoughts of magic, the magical thinking we talked about before, and punishment. Cause and effect thinking, it's a bit blurred. Uh, and again, it's very egocentric. I caused it because uh, it was yeah me to blame. It was my, my fault. Um, they have magical thinking and all illnesses that they can be at that stage where all illnesses can be contagious. So it's difficult for them to know what's inherited or what is, is actually contagious. Uh, then they move on to the ages seven, uh, between seven, 11. They can accept more of a germ theory um, as a cause for a disease. Not all illnesses are contagious. They accept that there are a few causal factors in precipitating illness. And uh, yeah. and illness may be caused by the failure of a specific body part. Now we're moving on to early teenage years and they have a better understanding and recognize that illness can be caused by psychological factors as well. Um, so thinking of the general development and the understanding of illness, we can think of how to be in a conversation with a child and a young person in relation to communicating that they they have yeah, an illness. 
I think I think it's also I think this is really interesting and I think it's important for us to be mindful as well of uh, a child in in their social group, I guess, or their peer group, because whilst we're saying that a child at age seven to 11 might have more ideas about illness being contagious, this too means that their peer group, their friends will also share that understanding. Right. And so their peer group or friends learning of a health condition might leave with ideas about this being contagious and you can see that 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 means certain interactions that maybe other children are more fearful or they stay away and so understanding this is really important because it means that we think about how to equip that young person to talk about mm -hmm. their health condition um, to to know or to understand that it's not contagious and how if they're sharing that with friends they share that in ways mm -hmm. that with that meaning or that understanding across. For some reason, I thought I saw a child, um, he was um, nine or 10, and he was saying that, oh, my mom had the car accident because I made her upset. Um, and that goes to part of the magical thinking of the blaming the self, cause and effect understandings. Yeah. Um, yeah, and it's interesting to keep the, these general, you know, ideas in mind. Um, and yeah, speaking about conversations and language, we thought that, um, yeah, we thought about language and how conveys meaning uh, and sometimes other or further than what we actually say or we think we say. And as adults, we have a different understanding of the words sometimes, mm -hmm. whereas children, because of all the things that we have just said, um, they may hear the words in a different way. So we need to be mindful when we communicate. Um, would you like to? Yeah, know? yeah. And we, we have some examples here to think about. So, for example, um, we know from our work with young people um, and conversations widely that certain words have negative connotations. Um, things like break down, the idea of cells breaking down, for example, or the idea of losing blood. Um, the word that's commonly used for sickle pain, a crisis. You can think about being a young child and hearing that you're experiencing a crisis and how how scary or frightening that might be. Um, and these words that we use in, in sort of common conversation, often without too much thought because they're what we're used to saying for a child, they can sort of provoke anxiety um, in their minds well, about those words or about how they understand them and also fearful fantasies. What does this mean? Um, and we children conjure certain ideas or certain images about the words that they're hearing, about the messages that we're sending, especially if conversations aren't happening openly and if they aren't aware of what they have um, or if they don't have an understanding of what what their health condition might be. Um, and this can lead to, to, to all sorts of ideas, um, scary thoughts, scary images that maybe they hold to themselves and maybe that fear gets bigger and bigger sometimes. Um, and we're thinking as well about the settings we work in and how certain words maybe um, remove a sense of individuality or identity um, from, from the young people that we see. Um, we're thinking about maybe things like sickler as a term that's commonly used, um, or thinking about things like when on a ward, we might say it's, it's a busy setting. You might find yourself saying, oh, it's sickle, sickle cell at bed four, or we just refer to them by bed numbers. And thinking about what that does to a, to a young person overhearing um, instead of maybe using, using their name. But just thinking about the impact of those things and how it reduces that person, I guess, to their medical diagnosis um, rather than everything else about them. Um, and thinking about thoughts spoken out loud, um, either amongst clinicians, sometimes when we're having professional conversations or to families. Um, so sometimes what we know is that young people come into the clinic 
or a, a medical space and maybe we as clinicians talk more to the parents and we're having a grown-up conversation in adult terms or using adult language but that young person is listening and taking aim based on the words that we're using and so we're going to buy to, to this idea of being mindful about the words we choose and about the messages we're sending because young people are absorbing all the time as we know and building their own understanding based on what they're hearing. Um, we know as well from families sometimes that maybe there's a sense of maybe feeling judged about not being around as much. So I think in particular, we're thinking about sickle and maybe how often young people will have to come into the hospital or to a &E. And maybe there being parents who you know need to work full time and it's very hard to get time off each time a young person needs to come into hospital and so there can be this real pull between wanting to be with your child but also you're quite used to the situation it's quite common for them to be in hospital and you need to go to work and you need to to earn a living and so there's this tension i guess for parents um, between those two things and maybe sometimes a bit of a a judgment or them feeling a bit judged for not being there with their child when they want to be and equally from the perspective of staff that can maybe feel a bit jarring or that can feel a bit surprising to see parents who aren't around um, for their child who's in hospital when all of the other parents seem to be or other families seem to be. And I guess I'm saying that thinking about the context and the particular story of this young person um, who maybe is more familiar with the hospital setting and needs to come in more often. Um, and so I think we've added here, um, thinking about the last slide as well, this sort of cause and effect or magical thinking that younger children might have. Um, so thinking maybe that they are being punished even um, by being sick um, because they didn't do something right. Um, they didn't do what they were told that day uh, or they didn't take medication and now they're sick. So they maybe develop ideas about it's my fault. Um, I caused this, um, I was bad and now I'm sick. And you can see how they maybe develop strange or what sound like strange ideas about things being their fault or maybe them feeling to blame. I just wanted to say thank you to the, our patients uh, for providing all these interesting and important information in our sessions and thank you to all the nurses who sat with us and we did something like a focus group um, so we were able to hear the nurses experience uh, as well um, and how overwhelming can be for them uh, on a busy ward um, having to yeah mm. uh, manage and juggle with um, everything um, and yeah, m moving on and following on the same path, we we then thought about the main um, the main reason that patients with sickle cell uh, come to the hospital, come to A and E, uh, is be because of painful episodes or acute chest syndrome, and um, continuing yeah on the same path of um being mindful and language and what we convey um <clears throat> yeah we thought about their experience when they come to a and e uh so when they come to a and e and they have to be admitted um it's because um uh, they have a really bad experience at that moment it means that they have already tried everything at home both medication and non-pharmacological strategies. They've tried all the relaxation strategies that they know, they've taken all the medication that they have and they can take, uh, because actually they don't want to come to the hospital. Uh, and coming to the hospital for the families and the patients is the last resort. That is what they communicate to us. Um, and especially children and young people, especially children, they feel anxious and worried about coming to the hospital. They don't want to come to the hospital because when they, <clears throat> uh, what they fear, what they worry about is, okay, if I come to the hospital, am I gonna leave ever? So there is a fear of dying 
uh, on the line every time they come to the hospital. Uh, am I going to leave? How, how long I'm going to stay or am I going to leave ever? Um, there is fear of pain, more pain, even though they know that they come to the hospital and they take pain relief and the pain goes away, but still they are fearful of the pain. And also they worry because they will have to miss school, they, they miss their family, they miss all the fun things that they, they would do if they weren't in hospital. And more specifically, um, they fear if they have a specific phobia of needles and procedures, so they are terrified coming to the hospital. Um, but some of the children, some of the patients, they may have a plan with them, on them, a toolbox, as we call it, um, and that plan says how they would like things to be done. That's an example that we done with them, with the child. Um, every time they come to the hospital, they can show that to uh, the nurses um, and they can convey, they can let the professionals know how they would like things to be done so they would feel more comforted, more comforted, more reassured, safer. And for them to feel, oh, I'm listened uh, and I'm not going to have, you know, an, a, a negative experience. Um, so the, this is a template, an example of um, a plan. And we, we are saying that because of what we said, they come to the hospital as the last resort. They've tried everything. So uh, it's important for us as clinicians to believe our patients the parents, the patients, the family members, that they come to the hospital and they share their experience. It's their true experience. And also it's interesting to know that more pain is experienced or, or higher levels of pain during stressful periods. So always we're trying to be mindful what may be going in the child or the family's life outside of the hospital. Yeah, yeah. We have 10 more minutes. OK, Maria is keeping us to time. Yeah. Um, so thinking about that, I guess the the central thing we're saying here is that when children come to the hospital or to A&E, um, they come carrying all their past experiences for the better or the worse. And parents the same too. When they come to the hospital with their child, they come carrying all their previous experiences for the better or the worse. Um, and this is the same for all of us, as you can imagine. Um, I don't know if, for example, you've ever had a, a tricky dentist appointment, for example, and the next time you had to return, maybe you felt a bit more anxious about going, maybe you felt a bit more nervous about going in. And that's a small example, I guess, of what we're saying. And so if young people or parents have a previous difficult experience in coming to the hospital um, or for some unfortunately even a traumatic experience of coming to the hospital then each time they come back to a &E, they are more anxious more cautious um, maybe more guarded or even more skeptical um, they're expecting the same thing again maybe they're expecting to relive a similar experience and we think about what that means in practice, what that means for a young person to come in um, feeling so anxious or feeling on guard. And that that means either difficult or traumatic experiences in the past will shape what's happening in the present in the hospital. Um, and Sometimes we don't know that. Sometimes, particularly on a, a you know a busy A and E setting, met with a young person, we won't know what's happened in their past. We won't know the story of what's gone before, and all we see in the present um, is their behaviour now. And so, unknowingly, our language or our behaviour might trigger certain responses. And that might be difficult responses. It might be that something we say um, triggers um, a fear response um, or triggers, I, I'm thinking, maybe difficult behaviour um, or a young person becomes highly distressed and you're not sure why because 
you aren't aware of, of the thing you have tapped upon, which might be what happened last time they were here that was really difficult. Um, and so we're thinking, we're always thinking in services about in trauma, trauma informed practice and holding in mind um, the stories that people carry when they come into hospitals, holding in mind that difficult things may have happened in the past and what that means for now in the present. And we say all of this uh, carrying on the previous message that is how important it is for all of us to be mindful um, of the language we use, to be mindful of the words that we choose, um, and to be mindful of maybe checking with the young person or checking with the family um, how they are, what's happened before. Um, and we're thinking as well at the end that published cases or published deaths in the media um, that can be specific to the health condition, specific to single, for example, or something else. Um, but these things that are published widely in the press mean that maybe parents feel more anxious or more fearful um, or feel particularly protective when they come in with their child um, about the care that they will receive. And this, I guess, is what we as clinicians might be on the receiving end of is fear or protectiveness or anxiety. We see one, two, three. Okay. So yeah, um, in our experience, what we've heard from the families as well and the patients, they may feel that they're not listened sometimes, or their views are not taken into consideration. They may feel that they, 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 <clears throat> there may be a racial aspect as well. Um, because they come from certain particular um, minoritized groups, they may be treated in a different way. Uh, media, um, you know, um, gives more uh, fuel into that as well, as well as, you know, previous experiences. They may appear, um, if you work on a busy ward, you may, how that may look like is parents being more anxious, more agitated, they may be angry or tearful, uh, they may be appear more demanding, uh, interfering with your work, questioning your work. Um, so it's not easy what you have to, uh, what you will experience as uh, clinicians yourselves. Uh, parents may appear to be not present or supportive to the children because they're not there. Uh, that adding more work uh, and more, uh, yeah, more work, more worries um, on you. And they can present in many other ways that we can't capture now on one slide. But all these can be a presentation of a parent um, coming from their own history, their own narrative. Um, at the end, we feel that we need to be as well mindful of any existing neurological or neurodevelopmental difficulties that the child may have or the parent for that matter, making the communication um, more difficult or more um, that we need to be aware of the needs so we would know how to communicate um or mental health mm -hmm. or other mental health difficulties it makes me think a bit like the little toolbox you shared earlier yeah. with kids. sometimes young people have passports if they're yeah. more um neurodevelopmental difficulties yeah. for example so that you can be mindful of any additional yeah. communication needs and what you may notice in parents and children um parents may appear to be more anxious angry low in mood uh, they may come with difficulties supporting adherence to medication in relation to the children. They may come with, you know, marital relationship difficulties and you may see parents on the ward, you know, arguing. Uh, you may see increased conflict with the other children, strong beliefs that are contrary to the medical advice. Um, they can be over, overly protective of the child um, or appearing to be detached. Um, they may struggle to separate the child's illness or circumstance from the wider family problems. Then in the time you may see again anxiety, anger, aggression, poor concentration if they don't pay attention, difficulty separating from the parent or arguments with the parents. 
um, that coping strategies when they are on the wards may look as if they're not in pain, playing on their phone or tablet, but actually that's a distraction for them how to manage the pain and the difficult situation or the worries are having to come to the hospital and stay. Uh, and the expression of pain may vary. Uh, some people are more um, they externalize the pain and the um, distress. Other people are more are quieter, uh, and they may be tearful or they may seem aloof, as if not in pain, uh, because every person is a different person and they react in a different way. Um, and last slide uh, is about the clinicians, all of us. We may feel frustrated and angry. Uh, it may be difficult, it may feel difficult to tolerate seat with the feeling of a child who cries or they are in distress. Uh, we may feel that we need special support uh, to support the child and usually uh, psychology comes to people's minds. Let's call the psychology. Uh, pain is a human condition and it is expected and typical for the child to feel all these things that we talked about, angry, tearful, uh, so everything is expected <laughs> in that sense. Again, be mindful of potential past experiences and how they may have come to shape the parent or the child's behaviour uh, in any medical setting. Unconscious biases of clinicians are our own biases. Um, again, um, contribute, uh, again, biases in relation to race, age, even the health condition or any other. Um, it's really important for us to try to be empathetic, open to listen, uh, going with a curious stance, kind and honest, clear communications and for us to do what we're saying we're going to do, be consistent uh, and all of these may sound too much and difficult on a busy ward and we appreciate that. Uh, and I know we all try our best, and that's the end. Thank you. We're right on time, I think, Saba. Thank you. We've got about five minutes, so let's see if we've got some questions. I've got one here uh, in the chat. Uh, how would you advise supporting or tackling non-compliance? How can we, as the medical slash nursing team, tackle that within the clinical setting? It's a very good question. It is a very good question and maybe we'll both share something. Mm. I think the biggest thing in my experience of working with young people, the biggest thing that makes the difference is taking the time to be curious. And it comes back to that curious stance Maria was just talking about. Um, to be curious in thinking with a young person about what's difficult and where it, where it is difficult because it's, you know, it's not what most young people would choose to have to do to take medication um, and so I think being curious helps for lots of young people maybe there isn't always an understanding of what the medication is what it does how it works um, and therefore maybe not as much of an impetus to take it without an understanding of how effective it might be um, and so I think it's really important to take the time to be curious about their understanding and about what might be difficult with taking medication and maybe the responses then help inform you um, as a clinician around what you can do to support what information you can you can add to that young person um, to help them grow an understanding. And I'm thinking adherence can cause um, great anxiety to the clinicians um especially in sickle cell and thalassemia and um, th um the important thing to keep in mind uh, for me uh besides what stacy said is that um it, it's not something that can happen in one session in one conversation adherence to medication is a long process uh, and it's um, an ongoing discussion between the patient, the child, the young person, the family, the parents and the clinicians. It's ongoing. It may take a long time because there, there may be many different contributing factors from culture, health beliefs, practical problems, many things come into play. 
uh, into, as you said, understanding where the difficulty is, how we can help. So I think it's important to take the, it's the responsibility of the patient and the clinicians equally at the same time. It's not one person's responsibility. We all contribute and it's not an easy thing. It's an ongoing discussion and conversation, trying each time to be curious and see where are the, where are the barriers, where are the obstacles, how we can help. Thank you. And um, Amanda just put there, would you also apply that to the parents? And I think we definitely would apply that to the parents. It's surprising, actually, even though we've been seeing these families from birth, how much they either forget about why they're taking it, administering it or, you know, life happens and these kind of, if it's not in habit, it slips off. It's important that anyone that has, you know, a couple of minutes to put the time in because so many different teams see these patients on admission or in clinic to always have that ongoing narrative and ongoing conversation. Like you said, Maria, it's not a one day fix all type thing it's like you know the peds consultant comes and has the convo we come and have the conversation you know the nurse on the ward will come and have the conversation it's a it's a hard subject <laughs> it's a hard one it's not an easy one it's not a quick fix but it's the ongoing just prompting and then maybe you know we hope that something clicks and sticks <laughs> And if anyone is more interested motivational interviewing strategies yeah. and skills are very helpful Yes, I've recently, not recently, but I've done a course with Novartis on that as well. So there are courses available if um, people wanted to jump onto that. Lovely. A couple of minutes for a couple more questions. Mira. Sorry, can I just, yeah, yeah. Um, um, I missed it because I was on the phone, but were you talking about um, uh, medications, and taking medications and forgetting it? Is that what it was about? Just adherence, just yeah, techniques adherence, on yeah. how to tackle so, adherence. Yeah. yeah, you're right. I For my smoking cessation in pediatrics, that's exactly what I use is motivational interviewing. So um, thank you, Maria, for share, saying it um, because it's really helpful. And I think with, for example, when I'm talking about with that asthmatic or respiratory or bronchitis, um, you were saying is there is, I think sometimes the amount of conversation we have with them is sometimes actually constructive because they have the same conversation with the nurse, same conversation, so many. And I, especially with um, with teenagers, the more conversations you have in there, the more switch off. You know, the more you tell them, you go like, oh my gosh, I'm, how many times did I say to you, you 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 have all this information, they switch off. What I found is um, to give them an actual practical things what to do with it. Do you know what I mean? A very simple bullet point. We've, we've done their information. They know the information. They're not stupid, okay? So I don't think it's the information they're lacking. It's that we're giving them information, but we're not giving them tools to, do, you know, like for example, with asthma, um, you know, same with inhalers every day, right? And then if they if they take it, they don't see any difference. Okay, so all I say to them, have it as a habit. So the mm -hmm. word habit, December, is really important because I say to them, do this as a habit, and do them oh, with it. the brushing teeth. And then have mm. it somewhere where your where your toothbrush is, so you don't have to look for it. And they go like, "Oh, this makes sense," because teenagers want an easy life. So if you make it easier for them, they are more likely to listen to you. To go like, "Oh, okay, I got this message," and that's where you you know. So that's it's, it. it's yeah. and the tools how to make life easy because teenagers are about easy life as much as possible, right? Yeah. Yeah. That ties in with your child development slide that you had actually that your approach also changes as they grow. So one thing that we do particularly for our transition age uh, patients is offer dosset boxes. Will it help if it's all just ironed out and labelled for you? Is this a you know tactic that would work? So yeah, yeah, practical. You know, it's finding it's having the conversation to find out what the problem is or what the reason is as to why there might be non-adherence, and then trying to find the correct path to tackle that. I suppose. But the, the reason can be yeah. something very um, general. Um, I'm thinking about um, I'm thinking about creating an environment for the families, both parents and children. And the younger the children, we have to provide the environment for the parents for them to feel safe that they can open up. So if we as clinicians, we come from a curious point of view, if we're curious, uh, we can learn more about what is difficult for them. Uh, I'm thinking of a family who uh, they didn't want to take hydroxycarbamide, for example, or do transfusions, receive transfusions as a treatment. And the reason behind that was cultural beliefs and what as a culture 
they believe in relation to health and treatments. Because here at King's, we see people coming from, you know, all walks of life, all different cultures, different countries. So it's uh, we don't see one person and one size fits all. So that's why I think we're talking about being curious to learn about the families, their stories and what it's important for them and what is difficult for them. Um, I'm going to just take this one last question and then we'll move on to uh, Dr. Bruin's talk. But if there's anything else that comes up, then I'll certainly feed back to you guys and we can address it a little bit later. So Mandy here's put, thank you very much. I feel as soon as parents, caregivers, hear psychologists, counselling or anything to do with mental health, they don't want to engage or support the idea of seeing a specialist. This condition affects their child in the long run psychologically. So what would you advise? Again, a big topic. We can't force anything to do. Uh, I think it's all about the, the timing. Um, the, uh, when uh, Many times what we see as a difficulty, it's not yet experienced by the families or the child as a difficulty. It's more in tune with them. So sometimes, even if it's difficult for us, we need to wait for the right time. Uh, and it may take a bit longer. Yeah, what we can do, uh, normalize psychology. We're here, we're part of the holistic care uh, because actually there is an impact, there is a, um, how can I say that, um, an e interrelation <laughs> uh, because we are mind, body and brain, we're all these three things. Uh, so we're here because we're part of the care, uh, we're part of what we think important when the right time comes, we're here to welcome. Lovely. Thank you very much, Maria and Stacey, for taking the time today. Um, I you. hope that was OK. Um, right, so we're going to move on to our next talk. So this is going to be delivered by Dr John Bruin, who is a paediatric haematology consultant here at King's College Hospital, and he's going to be discussing the um, Oh, management of acute neurological complications and sickle cell disease. Um, again, questions in the chat and hands up towards the end. That'd be great. Thanks very much. Thanks, John. Uh, good morning, everyone. Hello. Um, thank you for having me to talk today. Uh, let me just try and share my slides. Can you see that? Yeah, yep, we can see them there. Yeah, lovely. Perfect. Um, so, yeah, so my name is Dr. John Bruin. I'm a uh, paediatric haematology consultant here at King's College Hospital. Uh, and I'm just going to try and talk through some of the neurological complications that can occur in sickle cell disease and thalassemia, because we don't want to forget about thalassemia. Um, so it's a really big site of um, complications for children with sickle cell disease and adults with sickle cell. Uh, there's a very high risk of a number of different complications. Um, so most importantly, um, acute stroke events, uh, which we define as um, symptoms that are lasting for greater than 24 hours, areas of new weakness or cognitive dysfunction uh, with abnormalities confirmed on a scan is usually fairly important. Uh, we'll talk about that in a bit more in detail. There's also transient ischemic effects where there is a uh, weakness to a limb or slurred speech, but it resolves within 24 hours. And generally, we don't detect any permanent change on uh, imaging. Uh, patients also have risk of what we call silent cerebral infarcts, um, which are like the opposite of transient ischemic events in that there is no clinical um, uh, evidence of an event. They have no weakness or no change in their speech or anything similar, but that we can see something permanent on the MRI scan where there's a little bit of ischemic damage. Um, later in life, they also develop risks of acute hemorrhage. Uh, there's also um, development of cognitive impairment, and then there are some other symptoms that um, are harder to define by imaging, but are definitely very common and they can have increased risk of seizures, headaches, and sometimes some visual symptom complications. And I'll try and cover through all of these first of all. So first of all, just to introduce the stroke risk um, in an untreated population, 10% of children uh, would have a stroke by the age of 18, uh, which is a very high rate. Uh, and the highest risk is in the first decade of life, particularly between the ages of four and seven. Uh, and then this stroke risk, which is a purple line, tends to fall in the 20s 
um, and then start to rise again uh, in their 30s and their 40s. And dovetailing with that is a risk of hemorrhagic stroke, which is a bleeding stroke, uh, which is um, most prevalent in the 20s. Fortunately, a lot less common because it's a lot harder to uh, recover from. Um, and both of these are very significant events in a child or adult's life in terms of morbidity and mortality. Um, so, as I've said, the stroke is an extremely common cause complication in children, uh, particularly in those with the most prevalent genotype SS, which is the most common form, uh, but also in the um, similar form S beta zero, but not so common in the uh, alternative forms, which are S beta plus and SC, which are different types of sickle cell disease, still have a lot of significant complications associated with them. But fortunately, stroke seems to be less common. Um, so as I said, stroke in children is extremely common. And in fact, they have a 300 times increased risk of stroke compared to children in, from the general population. Um, and fortunately, since we've been introducing Doppler screening, which I'll talk about a bit later, uh, we've been much better at um, preventing these strokes. And now it's down to about one or two percent of the children will have a stroke overall. Um, silent strokes, the silent cerebral infarcts are much more common. Um, and actually, if we screened everyone with an MRI scan, we'd detect about 37 percent of the children would have one by the age of 14. And we know that these are associated with cognitive dif difficulties and a higher risk of um, overt stroke. Um, the features uh, that we would detect if the per person presented to A&E with these symptoms are, hang on, this is, sorry, wrong, wrong, wrong bit of this one. Uh, so this is um, talking about the pathological basis of, um, of, of a stroke, and it's normally that they have a preceding vasculopathy that causes a stenosis in the major blood vessels su supplying the, um, the brain, and that eventually these get blocked by some uh, acute event that causes a lack of blood flow and therefore lot, lack of oxygenation to a crucial area of the brain that causes a stroke event. So we develop what we call watershed areas where the, the blood supply is the most tenuous because of these stenoses uh, and most um, uh, vulnerable to acute changes, uh, which can also be acute changes in um, blood pressure or anemia that can lead to the ischemia. There's also a complication called Moya Moya syndrome or, or vasculopathy, which is when they have a very friable blood supply that is very lots of new blood vessels being um, produced and grown because there's a lack of oxygen being delivered to the, the brain. Um, and this is a signal signaling response um, that causes Moya Moya syndrome. And it's a very vulnerable uh, blood supply that can quite easily cause a further ischemic or hemorrhagic stroke. Um, so what is a stroke event? This is the um, the MRI findings. And as we can see on the MRI, the, the CT scan on the left hand side here, uh, there is a big area here of um, black uh, changes, which is not healthy brain tissue. Uh, and this is the area that's been very heavily um, affected by the stroke. Um, and we can see on the MRI, on, on the angio angiography here, that it's quite hard to pick out if you're not used to looking at these things. But essentially on this side, we've got quite a good uh, supply and over here this blood vessel here just stops and there's no real blood flow beyond that uh, because there's an occlusion here. So risk factors for stroke in children, um, anyone who's had a previous transient ischemic event um, is very high risk for uh, a further overt and permanent stroke event and needs to be taken very seriously. Uh, anyone who's got significant anemia, um, and that can either be a chronic anemia, so they have a lower baseline haemoglobin. Typically in sickle cell disease, a haemoglobin is between 70 and 90 grams per litre, uh, but in some patients, they can be on the lower end of that spectrum, kind of 60 or 70, and those have a higher risk of stroke. Uh, but also patients who've got an acute anemia, such as if they've got a parvovirus and they've got a suddenly a very low haemoglobin, or they've had splenic sequestration that's caused a low haemoglobin, or they've had a very severe hemolytic episode that's caused them to drop their haemoglobin, and that could be a, a, an acute risk factor for stroke. Likewise, having had a recent acute chest syndrome increases the risk of stroke. And again, that's because of a lack of oxygenation that's going through the lungs uh, and the inflammation that comes from an acute chest syndrome that increases their risk of stroke. Uh, and having a high blood pressure is also recognised as a, a risk factor. There's a strong evidence that there's probably a genetic component to the risk factors for stroke. Uh, 
siblings have a much higher risk of stroke if they're there. One of their siblings has also had a stroke and likewise for the TCD scans. Um, other things that we screen for in clinic are evidence of silent cerebral infarcts. Uh, if they've got sleep disordered breathing, which by which we mean they've got very heavy snoring such that they develop obstructive sleep apnea, we know that this is associated with um, an increased risk of stroke. And we try to correct this by doing sleep studies on those who report snoring in clinic uh, and going on to um, refer them to ENT for consideration of um, adenoids and tonsils um, uh, surgical removal. Um, and then the most important thing now is that we have the um, ab ability to do transcranial Doppler studies uh, to screen these children. Uh, and this is, um, again, I think I've got a better slide to discuss this a bit later, so we'll come back to that in a moment. Um, finally, one thing to be wary of is um, steroids can be very effective in managing certain things um, for children, uh, but in sickle cell disease, it can actually be, uh, particularly when they stop the steroids, can cause a rebound a uh, vaso occlusive episode um, and also the steroids can increase the risk of a bleed because they they make the endothelium and the, the blood vessels a bit thinner until they've recovered. Uh, so this is the um, the theory behind transcranial Doppler studies. What we have here is a, a child's skull and we can see here the, the, the temporal window which is just above so we're looking down at the skull if you like here was an eyeball here uh, and the neck coming out through the bottom here. Um, and uh, we are applying an ultrasound probe here to the side of the head, and this is just above the ear, um, just on the temporal lobe, where there's the, the, there's a little bit of a kind of depression on the skull. And the bone, the window is normally the bone is normally a bit thinner here, and it's therefore possible to get the ultrasound waves in through the brain to um, to have a look at the the blood vessels here. Uh, and what we're looking at is these internal carotid artery and middle cerebral artery that come off the brain stem here. This is the circle of Winnis um, and the basilar artery. And what we are detecting is the flow of the blood um, through these arteries. And if we see that the blood flow is very high, um, we classify this as abnormal and they've got an extremely high risk of stroke uh, within the next year. Um, and then we recommend that they start on a transfusion program. So if they have an abnormal TCD, they've got a 10% risk per year of a stroke, which means that in 100 children, 10 of them would go have a stroke that year. So those ones are the ones we really want to target. And we commit them to a transfusion program to keep their sickle cell disease under as much control as possible. Um, we perform these scans um, every year for all children between the ages of two and 16. When I say all children, I mean that in the sense of those who have um, hemoglobin SS or hemoglobin S beta naught disease, those who have uh, so-called milder sickle phenotypes such as um, S beta plus or SC, uh, we tend to only do those at the ages of two, five and 10 because they have a much lower stroke risk. Uh, so patients who have abnormal TCDs, we put on a transfusion program. And those who have conditional range TCDs have a, a lower stroke risk, but it's still about 4% per year. So it's still not able to ignore it. Uh, and we strongly recommend hydroxyurea for them. If they are resistant to that idea or they've tried it before and they failed hydroxyurea, we might think about um, transfusions or we might just monitor their TCDs to see which way they go as to whether they develop to um, abnormal or whether they settle back down to um, normal range. And again, that's a little bit on to there's a, a kind of gray zone of whether they're high conditional, which is above 185 or low conditional, which is below 185 centimeters per second. Um, so this is the basis, as I said, of our primary stroke prevention program. Um, and this was the original um, seminal study, the STOP study, which showed that uh, we massively reduced the risk of stroke by putting anyone who had in an abnormal TCD, we uh, randomized them and 63% of the, 63 patients were put on a transfusion program. Only one of them went on to have a stroke, whereas 67 of them were not given a transfusion program because that's what we we're testing and 10 of them had a stroke and one of them also had a intracerebral bleed. So there was a massive reduction in strokes and they had to stop this trial early because it was so clear that this was a, a important intervention um, to start them on transfusion programs. What they then went on to look at in the STOP2 study was whether we could stop the transfusions um, because the trouble with transfusions is that you, it's an intensive program. Uh, there's a risk of alloimmunization from the blood, trans, blood product 
uh, and they can get iron overload, which has its own health complications down the line. So they looked at whether they could stop the transfusions after a certain period of time. Uh, but actually, those who um, did stop the transfusions, a lot of them went on to have abnormal TCDs again, uh, and a couple of them went on to have further stroke events. Whereas all those who carried on transfusions were had no complications or re-emergence of their cerebrovascular disease. So based on that, they realised that we can't stop transfusions altogether. Um, more recently, we've had the TWITCH study, which showed us that we, after one year of transfusions, we could consider switching them to hydroxyurea, uh, which is our most widely used drug for ameliorating sickle cell disease by increasing the fetal haemoglobin. Um, and we showed that if we can get them up to a decent dose on their hydroxyurea and a very good clinical response, we are able to stop the uh, transfusion safely with, with close monitoring of their TCD scans. And this is um, has not shown an increased risk of stroke in that cohort. So those are the primary prevention. Uh, when we are thinking about an acute event, um, these are the symptoms that we need to look at. Uh, when they come in the A&E, they, they might describe weakness in an arm or a leg. They might describe difficulty speaking, which we call aphasia, um, or they might have slurred speech or, or confused speech. Sometimes they are able to make words, but it has no sense and it's not what their brain is trying to, to convey as a communication. Uh, sometimes they might have a seizure event um, and sometimes they might have a limp, uh, which is unexplained and painless. Sometimes it can be really difficult to detect and it'd be very subtle motor changes. Sometimes they just start dropping things and you're not quite sure why. Um, and that's the um, the first sign that there's a, um, a stroke event, that there's a problem with their coordination. Uh, and this can be very difficult to pick out in young children um, who may not be as active or may not be able to explain what they're, they're, what's going wrong for them or why they, you know, they can't write all of a sudden. Um, but essentially, we, we need to have a very high index of suspicion. So when a patient um, is presenting to us with any of these symptoms or when we're looking after children and they present, they, they when they're an inpatient and they suggestive of these symptoms, we need to um, be very kind of wary that this could be a stroke event. Patients who are already in hospital because of other reasons due to their sickle cell disease are at higher risk of having a stroke. So it's important to be aware of this when you're looking after your children, uh, whether there's a risk um, motor changes or not. Um, so how to diagnose an acute stroke, as we talked about, the history and the symptoms are very important. Uh, the most important thing is to be aware that this is a possibility. I think that's always probably one of the dangers when people, pediatricians and, and pediatric nurses who are looking after their children, maybe don't have stroke as a particular high thing to think about in their mind because it's so uncommon in most children. Uh, but in sickle cell, we always have to make sure we're thinking about it. So I think that's one of the most important lines, which is why it's in bolder to say we have to make sure we're always thinking about whether they have had a stroke or not. Um, then the most important thing is that we try and get imaging. Ideally, we'd go straight to MRI, MRA because it's the most sensitive um, imaging, but usually it's more difficult to arrange that. And sometimes we need to go for a quick CT scan. If there's any suggestions of a delay, we'd go for a straight for a CT scan. That's mainly to check that whether this is an ischemic or a, a hemorrhagic event because they have very different management um, and also more in the adults to um, check whether there's a space occupying lesion. Um, anyone who is a child, we need to obviously think about whether they need a general anaesthetic, particularly for an MRI, MRA, which can take quite a long time and they need to lie very still for. If there's abnormal de neurology and a strong clinical suspicion, but we can't get these imagings confirmed or done before it, within a short type, space of time, then we need to get on with treatment. It's a bit like the stroke thrombolysis protocol in the adults. Uh, we really, you know, time is brain, as they always say, and we need to um, uh, get on with our treatment. Um, so the other investigations that we uh, need to go through are the standard kind of sickle cell screens. Um, so full blood counts and a hemolysis screen. Uh, we need to make sure they've got um, post-matched blood because the most important intervention that we're going to do is a um, blood transfusion. Um, and for sickle cell, we need to make sure that they have very specific blood available for them, uh, which needs to be sickle negative. That sounds like an obvious thing to say, but um, obviously patients with uh, or donors can donate if they are sickle trait, but we don't want to use um, blood from a donor, a trait donor. 
um, for obvious reasons because it just adds to more sickle cell in the system. So we choose donors that don't have sickle trait uh, and then we need to make sure that they've got an extended phenotype matching as well and also consideration of any prior antibodies because a lot of our cohort will have antibodies and so this needs to be uh, detected and particularly if the patient is new to the hospital they need to phone the transfusion lab at their regular site to find out what their trans their antibody history is um, and then as I said we need to go on and get an urgent CT scan at the very least if we can uh, and the things that we're looking at these are images actually from an MRI scan um, because this is so much so much clearer um, and it, this is uh, the the kind of problem that we're looking at this is that the um, the blood vessels um, and we can see here on the on the whenever I look at these things I'm not an expert at um, interpreting these things but we essentially are looking for a lack of symmetry is a bad thing uh, with this being the midline here um, and we can see here that um, this blood vessel here is very very thin and sketchy whereas this one's got a nice normal caliber here and so that's what we're trying to look at and these blood vessels here has also got a little bit occluded there's no joined up line between the two of them and that's probably suggestive of a um, ischemic area uh, where, the, where the blood flow is not flowing um, and likewise on this scan here this bit here um, shows that compared to this side there's a lack of um, uh, patency between these two spots of the blood so there's a very tight blood, blood flow between the two of them um, and then what we see uh, on the imaging of the brain is this area here has has got significant changes compared to the other side here and so this is where we've we've got tissue damage and ischemia uh, and again on the MRA imaging we've got a very tight and uh, thready blood vessel here that's not really lighting up and there's no real downstream uh, arterials being highlighted like there is here where, where we've got a nice nice healthy vascular supply so the immediate management of stroke um, is that we need to uh, maintain their oxygen saturation so keeping oxygen levels as high as possible make sure they're well hydrated but not overloaded um, and then we need to the most important thing is that they need a blood transfusion uh, in the first instance there's usually space to give a top-up transfusion uh, but usually when it's an exchange when it's a stroke event we actually want to go straight onto an exchange transfusion which is a more complicated uh, procedure that's usually um, led by the haematology team where we need to take blood off them at the same time as giving it to them. Usually, if we are able to, we do this on an automated apheresis machine that's run by the specialist um, nurses uh, or an apheresis team. Uh, but sometimes this is not always available and certainly not always available out of hours. And then it's a manual exchange where you are um, literally venesecting a unit of blood or an equivalent for the child uh, and then giving them the same back again and then venesecting and then giving them the same back until you've do done a whole volume exchange and there's a formula and a calculation and guidelines for um, doing that. Um, after that the management of the stroke is, is quite similar to um, the management of a stroke in a general population although that's probably more adult based so you may not have much experience of that uh, but essentially we do, we do speech and language therapy um, we think about other causes of their stroke and then they have ongoing physio and OT rehab. Um, we need to do a full assessment of their, their status and check that there are any holes in the heart that may have caused an embolism to pass through. We need to do a sleep study to see if they have sleep disordered breathing and then we need to do a neurocognitive assessment to see how much their brain functioning has been set, uh, impacted by this stroke and whether they're going to have special learning needs that need to be supported at school. Um, so I'm probably running out of time a little bit. Um, we need to think about the risk of their recurrence of stroke uh, because actually 70% would have a further stroke without a regular transfusion within two years of the first stroke which is a really high rate of recurrence. Um, Fortunately, with again with transfusion, we can we can reduce this quite significantly, but not eliminate it completely. There's still a small number that do go on to have progressive cerebrovascular disease. Um, and in those, there are more aggressive interventions that we can think about. So we need to make sure the key thing is that uh, when we're preventing stroke, we need to keep their sickle percentage less than 30% at all times and keep their hemoglobin uh, well supported. Uh, and this reduces the recurrence to about 10%. Usually these are in children three to four weekly top-up transfusions, but sometimes we can do them through 
automated apheresis so they're able big enough and able to tolerate the procedure and then this can usually be done, done slightly less frequently uh, some of the complications of the um, blood transfusion program is that they can get iron overload and then they need to start on iron collation therapy if they're on automated exchanges one of the benefits of this is it's iron neutral because we're taking blood off at the same time as giving them blood so they don't tend to accumulate iron in the same way finally anyone who's got cerebrovascular disease uh, is a candidate for a bone marrow transplant and we should look at whether they've got siblings fully matched siblings who would be a suitable donor um, and in those who've had um, over stroke events or progressive cerebrovascular disease it might be worth considering a haplo donor which is when we use one of the parents as a donor in the absence of a full sibling match um, so things that we can do for those who are deteriorating or have cerebrovascular disease despite their transfusion programs is that we can try and be even more aggressive on their management of their sickle percentage and get it down to below 10 percent instead of 30 percent we could add hydroxyurea in in addition to the transfusion program we make sure that they don't have any overnight hypoxia which is a sleep disorder bleeding problem so we make sure their sleep studies are up to date using aspirin and dipyridamol as an option but has generally gone out of vogue a little bit more um, and then there are surgical procedures neurovascular procedures that can improve the blood supply um, and then as i said we can also think about bone marrow transplant syndrome um, the surgical techniques for neovascularization are quite complex um, and it's just really to know that they are available uh, silent cerebral infarcts are important to know about as well as the neurological complication as i said these don't have a clinical um, uh, correlate so we only detect them when we do a routine mri scan which we tend to do about once in their teenage years um, and what we do know is that these are associated with a reduction in their IQ score and they do have an association with an increased risk of stroke as well. Um, and it's important to be aware of because sometimes, I mean, even in patients who don't have um, uh, silence cerebral infarcts, there can be a poor academic attainment um, and we need to be screening for that in our, our clinics. Uh, hemorrhagic stroke is, is more of a risk in um, early adulthood. Um, but it's a very significant um, complication. Mortality is very high when there's a hemorrhagic stroke and it's very difficult to get good functional recovery from. Uh, we're not quite sure why this risk switches from ischemic to hemorrhagic in this decade of life, uh, but it seems to be a, um, a fairly well-recognized thing. Certainly children, people with sickle cell disease do have an increased risk of aneurysms, uh, and that's one of the useful things of the MRI scans these days, is they're very good at picking up aneurysms. And then we have ongoing discussion with our neurosurgical colleagues about whether these require coiling or any other kind of intervention or not. Uh, so as I've mentioned, cognitive impairment is a really important aspect of sickle cell disease. Um, we know that they, those with strokes or even with silent cerebral infarcts have a significant reduction in their IQ score. Uh, but even with a normal MRI, it's estimated that um, children with sickle cell do have a slightly lower IQ score. And this has knock on effects in a, a matched population. Uh, so we do think that um, patients whose parents or even the child is reporting that they feel like they're, they're struggling at school or their uh, efforts have started to tail off and they're not doing as well as they used to do, we should think about whether we need to be doing a, an MRI to screen for some of these complications and referring them on to our psychologists, Maria and um, Stacey, who you've just heard from, to perform a full neurocognitive assessment uh, and see whether there's a, a deficit that could be um, addressed and uh, have a tailored educational health care plan. Uh, so just briefly, because we, as I said, we want to talk about, have I got time, Sabah, to talk about thalassemia very briefly? There's not, not much to say. Um, yeah, a apart couple of from, minutes should be fine. Yeah. Um, that we don't want to forget about them. They don't tend to have the same kind of significant stroke risks um, that sickle cell disease has, um, but they still can get complications. And most commonly, actually, their complications relate to the iron chelation therapy that we uh, commit them to because they're on regular transfusions. Iron chelation is one of the most important aspects of their health. Uh, but they can also get cord compression and peripheral neuropathy, and they also have some cognitive problems. So the visual and auditory problems that can occur are mainly due to the therapy. There's iron chelation therapy and they need regular screening um, and these should be done annually, ideally. Uh, and we need to inform the patients that they need to tell us about any any developing problems. 
um, and there's a therapeutic index that we should be calculating when we calculate the dose of um, iron chelation therapy to make sure that we're not um, exceeding this because if we go above this ratio then uh, the risk of toxicity rises quite quickly. So in eyes they can get a um, uh, uh, irreversible sometimes change of um, uh, vasculopathy uh, and this needs to be screened for by the ophthalmology team where they can get um, retinopathy um, and loss of acuity in their uh, visual fields. Uh, they can get a affect their hearing uh, and so they can get a high tone sensory neural deafness um, and this is particularly a risk when we've got very high doses of collating agents uh, and this is why they need to have annual checks and again unfortunately this can be irreversible so it's really important to detect it early and then uh, intervene by stopping the particular iron collation therapy and considering whether an alternative would be better suited for them. Uh, they can however develop um, complications due to the thalassemia itself and this is mainly as a result of um, uh, if they haven't had enough blood transfusion, they, they have an extramedullary hematopoietic dry tissue, which is essentially um, uh, bone marrow activity outside of the bone marrow. So as you can see here, their spinal area where normally there'd been some, some bone marrow activity within the spinal cord column, and it's caused a massive outgrowth, and this can cause compression on the spinal cord itself. Uh, and likewise in the chest X-ray here, we can see areas of uh, extramedullary hematopoiesis. Uh, so things that we need to do for this kind of problem are that we need to think about an urgent MRI to classify it. We need to think about radiotherapy to zap these areas essentially and stop the hematopoiesis happening. We need to make sure their transfusion regime is really up to speed and, and excessive, if anything, to make sure that they lose that um, hematopoietic drive that's coming from a lack of oxygen and lack of blood. Uh, and then we can think about hydroxyurea as well, which also helps to suppress um, extramedullary hematopoiesis. Um, so in summary, um, neurological problems are very important to think about in sickle cell disease, but also in thalassemia. Uh, in sickle cell disease, they have a very early onset um, complications uh, that can be both silent with either the silent cerebral infarcts or the um, vasculopathy that we can detect on TCDs and on MRI scans, but also importantly can be overt. And when it is overt, it can be devastating uh, and having a, a significant stroke event can have a real complication and impact on the rest of their life. So it's really important that we have mechanisms to detect this early and that's what the TCD scans are. Uh, and that's one of the main functions of our, our routine clinics is to make sure that these are up to date and these are checked and these are acted upon. Um, and then we need to think about the other risk factors that can uh, precipitate it um, and uh, be aware of this as a complication of other acute episodes that this can develop from. So particularly acute chest syndrome, if a patient is in the hospital with acute chest syndrome or the severe anemia, we need to have a very high index of suspicion that they might be um, developing a stroke event and thinking about whether they're using their limbs evenly, whether they're limping, but not because of pain affecting that area, or whether their speech and their cognition has suddenly changed in some way. Uh, for thalassemia patients, um, this is mainly a risk of their chelation therapy, as I've said, um, and sometimes it's because of an under, under transfusion that they've developed extramedullary hematopoiesis. And again, this is about telling the patients that this is a complication so that they come back to us and tell us what the problems are when it occurs, and also so that they know that they need to attend their regular screening so we can detect early changes. Uh, so I think that's the end of my slides. I'm very happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thanks very much for that talk um, there, John. I've got two questions here in the chat um, and then we'll look at heading off for lunch possibly. So uh, first one, why is there high effect for a stroke if patient, whoops, with sickle cell patients, if a sickle cell patient snores, sorry, is it the low oxygen overnight? Yeah, exactly. So um, the low oxygen saturations overnight um, can be a precipitation for uh, I think for for uh, lower perfusion of the brain at, at night um, that then increases the vasculopathy and the inflammation that's going on in the brain that increases the risk of stroke in the long run. Lovely, thank you. And then another one, is crizolizumab licensed for adults only and does this treatment help with reduction of strokes or anemia to prevent restriction of blood and oxygen supply? 
so it's only licensed at the moment for 16 year olds and above um, there are some clinical trials ongoing that allow us to give it to some children younger than that um, but hopefully it's going to be become available for children as well um, soon um, once these studies are completed uh, but it is only for um, prevention of pain episodes. So far, we've got no evidence that it has any benefit on um, stroke events um, or improving oxygenation or anemia. Um, so it just the way it works is it stops the red cells being quite so sticky in the bloodstream um, so that they don't get blocked essentially and cause vaso occlusion. Um, but we don't have any evidence that it does anything else apart from that. Lovely, thanks very much. And just uh, another comment come through. So um, sometimes, particularly the young children with pain crisis have pain in limbs so much that they avoid moving it. Um, how do you rule out a stroke in that sort of a scenario? Yeah, I think that's a really important question. It's very difficult to know. Um, and I think um, there is no straightforward way to ruling it out, but I think you have to, if they have got pain in that limb, that is a very good reason for them not to be moving that limb. Um, usually it's only in one arm or one leg, whereas a stroke would affect both the arm and the leg. Um, the stroke might also have a droopiness of the face, facial mo muscles as well, um, and some slurring of speech. And obviously that's a, a far more extensive stroke. But I think if it is just one limb that's not moving because it's painful, then you can kind of attribute that to that problem. Um, and I, but I think you're right. I think you have to keep a very close eye on that and, and really make sure the doctors have thought about that as a um, as a um, consideration when they they're assessing the child. I suppose having a in-depth history taking would help to rule out what could have caused the painful episode versus is this a stroke maybe? Yeah. 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 Lovely. OK, thank you very much. Um, I am um, sorry, just on that oh, as well. I mean, exactly that kind of thing. So also looking at their previous TCD scans, uh, whether they've had an MRI scan to suggest whether they've got a um, susceptible blood, blood supply in the brain already or not would also help you weigh that up. Perfect. Thanks very much. Um, right, so in this leads us up to uh, lunch. <laughs> so this is happy days. Um, just so just a reminder that we are going to we are recording these sessions so I think we're going to poss possibly pause it over the lunch break and restart for approximately one o'clock if there are comments or chats or anything that you guys want to have please do continue in the chat box and I can address some things just more about to restart at one o'clock um, and then we will take it from there I hope that's okay um, and I'll see everyone back here for around one to start on the afternoon session, which will be uh, myself and, and not Kelly, unfortunately, just talking about blood transfusion considerations in these patient groups. OK, lovely. Thank you very much.